with uh, nitrous oxide, the, the wealthy people. So the, uh, the uh, drug for the poor people was gin, the drug for the wealthy people was nitrous oxide. And they would have nitrous oxide parties. Uh, another name for nitrous oxide is uh, laughing gas. <clears throat> nitrous oxide is also a neurotransmitter. This is something we ju have just discovered. It has to do with uh, the male erection. Uh, of course, uh, erections. Okay, we can talk about erections. Anyway, uh, nitrous oxide has something to do with that. Another name for, for nitrous oxide is laughing gas. Uh, if you've ever been to the dentist uh, and said, I don't want to use Novocaine, then potentially they'd use nitrous oxide. Uh, you can go to a dentist that doesn't uh, shoot you up in Novocaine, and they will use a nitrous oxide to knock you out. So they used to have these parties where if you, if you give them enough gas uh, to almost knock them out, uh, they, they start floating around, they like float in the room, they feel like they're floating around the room, and of course then they react, they, they become inebriated. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, a lot of times it makes them uh, aggressive. It really all depends on their personalities. It's kind of like the alcohol. Sometimes when people drink, uh, they get happy. Sometimes when they drink, they get goofy. Sometimes when they drink, they get sad. Some people get sad. Uh, when I drink, I get sad. And so I haven't had a drink since 1975. Because I'm not, I'm not real bright, but I'm not stupid. <clears throat> it made me unhappy. Why the hell would I drink something? Why would I take something into my system that makes me unhappy? That's just completely illogical. So I, I don't drink. It's one of the reasons I don't drink. Uh, that and I don't like the taste of it. It tastes like it. doesn't taste good. has a bad flavor. I've never tasted any alcohol that tasted good. Oh, you ought to try this. Yeah. I tried that once upon a time. Uh, morphine was about 10 times as potent as, as opium. Uh, the morphine, uh, w morphine was used during the Crimean War and the Civil War to treat the wounded casualties. Uh, many men became addicted to the painkiller after these wars, and they called it the soldier's disease, the fact that they were hooked on morphine, and the fact that they needed to get this, and they'd go to the chemist, and they, they would, uh, try, they would uh, use morphine. Well, if you know anything about opiates, uh, if you use a select amount today, if you use the same amount tomorrow, you're not going to get the same effect. So one of the problems was that they had to increase the amount of uh, uh, morphine that they were in, uh, taking in. So the, and that, they called that the uh, soldier's disease. Opium became dangerous to life and limb with the development of morphine, but it, could, it would get worse, of course. Uh, in 1855, the hypodermic needle was invented, making it possible to inject the morphine. Before that, you swallowed it. Uh, and actually, you lost some of it in your, by, uh, through di digestion. And of course, since it had to be digested, uh, then it was absorbed into your bloodstream, and of course, it was taken out through your liver. Uh, so if you ingested it, you didn't get nearly the buzz that you got if you injected it. You injected it, it went right into your system, immediately into your system, and you got a better effect. It also took less of it to affect you. In 1874, morphine was synth synthesized into diacetyl uh, morphine or heroin. Heroin was two and sometimes five times stronger than morphine. So people started using heroin instead of morphine. We still use morphine as a medication today, but we don't use heroin. But you could buy it. You could buy heroin at your pharmacist, at the chemist. Opium became uh, involved in one of the oddest events in the history of psychoactive substances. The British were addicted to the caffeine and tea, <clears throat> but the Chinese demanded silver bullion to buy it. I think we talked about this. The British had no commodity that the Chinese wanted, but the Chinese would, uh, that they would buy in silver. So they were losing lots and lots of currency. They were losing lots and lots of silver, and the Brits didn't like that. The Chinese had eradicated opium smoking uh, from their country in 1,000. So they didn't have any opium problems. Well, they did have some opium problems, but it was always smuggled across the border. The uh, penalty for smuggling opium was, was be being beheaded. Uh, the penalty for smoking opium, for using opium, was death. So that's how the Chinese controlled it. And they did this for 800 years. 
did it for 800 years until the English decided that they needed a uh, commodity to trade with the Chinese. In 1839, the British battled the Chinese to open their ports to opium trade. The Chinese lost the war in 1842. It took them three years to beat the Chinese. But they won. And so they opened their, uh, their ports to the opium trade. Isn't that great? Okay, so now they could sell the Chinese opium for silver, and then they could buy tea for silver. So these tea companies that you have in England, these famous tea companies, Earl, Earl Grey and all the rest of it, they made their money. The only way they were able to trade for tea was by trading opium. So these were actually opium dealers, these tea companies. We're not done. So they had select ports where they could trade their opium. The Brits wanted to open more ports in China. So what they did in 1856, they started another opium war to open up more ports. It took them four years to beat the Chinese this time. But the Chinese lost again. Uh, trade went from 15 tons in 1800 to 2.5 million tons by the turn of the 20th century. 2.5 million tons. The British had uh, cheap tea, of course, and the Chinese had a new addiction. Or actually, it's an old addiction. But uh, that has to do with the, the uh, opium wars. There were two of them. One in uh, 18, uh, the 1830s, 1839 through 1842, and the other one was in 1856 to 1860. You know, when we're talking about substance abuse. We really shouldn't be talking about wars. But unfortunately, of course, the English forced the Chinese to open their ports. Uh, 1859, uh, cocaine was synthesized from the coca leaf. It quickly became a new medication. And they started using it as a new medicine that they used in different, uh, in different forms. Uh, it was used as a topical anesthet anesthetic, uh, and it was used for eye surgery. It was mixed with wine to make a, a, a new, stronger concoction, uh, oh, uh, cocaine wine. Uh, it was used by Freud to control asthma, to control gastric problems as an aphrodisiac, and to relieve depression. Uh, he used it for a number of years, and of course Sarah likes to talk about this, the fact that he was a cokehead. Uh, the reality is he, he didn't use it all that long. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't uh, uh, negate uh, any of the positive things that he said. Uh, during the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, many pat patented medicines were manufactured with what would become illegal drugs. Uh, Coca-Cola was first manufactured with 5 milligrams of cocaine. That's what the coca stands for. Coca-Cola, cocaine-cola. Uh, and it, contains, uh, it continues to contain coca extract with the cocaine removed. So the reason that you drink Coca-Cola uh, because, is because of its distinctive flavor. The distinctive flavor, if you drink Pepsi, if you compare Pepsi with Coke, Pepsi doesn't have the same flavor that Coke does. The reason is because of the cocaine. I mean, sorry, it's because of the Coke. That's the flavor that you get. It doesn't taste like, it, what it tastes like to me is uh, uh, Beeman's chewing gum. Have you ever had Beeman's chewing gum? Uh, anyway, there's a, there's a flavor, and that I, that's what I taste when I drink Coke. I don't like the flavor so much. Anyway, Coca-Cola is the number one uh, purchaser of Trujillo coca leaf in the world, and they use the extract to make their Coca-Cola as odd. Of course, it doesn't have any coca Yeah, it doesn't have any cocaine in it. But yeah, it has coca still. Yeah, it's not the same. So if you drank a Coke and then uh, did a, a, a drug test, they wouldn't drink that. Because they don't make, they don't uh, test for coca, they test for cocaine. Of course, uh, here we are in the United States. Uh, you know, it's, it, you read the history book and everything's perfect. We're fighting for democracy every day. And we're fighting against this person and that person. But the reality is, things weren't perfect in the United States. Lots of bad stuff was taking place in the United States. Uh, a lot of alcohol was being drunk in the United States. Uh, we're not talking about beer, and we're not talking about wine. They used, they drank beer and wine like soda pop. They were drinking hard stuff. And if you've ever watched an old movie, 
Uh, especially in the movies before the 1930s, uh, these people are drinking really large glasses of hard liquor. And they drank a lot of it. They drank buckets of this stuff. They weren't drinking beer, they weren't drinking wine, they were drinking hard liquor. Uh, corn, corn whiskey, they were drinking, they weren't drinking vodka, of course, that was too fancy to drink. Uh, but they were drinking anything hard, any, any hard liquor that they could find. Uh, drunk and high men uh, made very poor workers, but they also made very poor husbands. Uh, really bad husbands, because they were drunk. Um, it takes away your inhibitions. So they were beating their wives, they were beating their children, they were raping their wives, and sometimes, unfortunately, of course, they were molesting their children. These kinds of things were taking place. Uh, so the women in the United States decided that they were going to change all this. They were going to do something to change their men from being these drunk assholes. They were, to, they were going to change them. So the first temperance movement started in 1826 in the United States. Uh, the temperance movement. And of course, we make fun of the temperance movement to, uh, now uh, because we, uh, we see them as blue noses. We see them as individuals trying to change something that didn't need to be changed. Uh, but the reality is, of course, these were women who had been, uh, were being molested. They were women who were being beaten by their husbands. Uh, they were women uh, who, uh, and, and not only that, but the church supported men being in charge of everything. So you've got this drunk jerk as in charge of your family. And according to the church, you didn't have a, a right to say no. If he wanted sex, you gave you had to give him sex. If he wanted sex in a select way, you had to give him sex in a select way. That was the way. If they got beat, they couldn't say anything. I'm sorry? If they got beat, they couldn't say anything. No, of course not. It wasn't illegal for a man to beat his wife. People thought it was funny that he would, and sometimes they would suggest, you need to hit your wife more. As odd as that sounds. This is an ugly, ugly time. And we weren't controlling alcohol. And alcohol was the engine. It was the fuel that the engine was running on. All of this abuse. Uh, to understand why temperance was so widely accepted in the United States, we have to understand the, the woman's lot in the early 19th century. Contraception was illegal. It wasn't just not practiced. It was illegal to use contraceptives. It was illegal to even talk about contraception. So she had no choice but to not use it. She couldn't use it. It was illegal. She would be arrested if she tried to use any contraceptives. Uh, so women tended to have a lot of children. Well, that was okay with the federal government because they needed more and more people. They wanted more and more people in the United States. So they didn't mind if a lady got pregnant uh, every year. They didn't mind if she had 13 or 14 kids. That's okay. <clears throat> the drinking pattern in the United States followed the path of the cheapest booze. Corn liquor was less, uh, the least expensive. So men tended to drink voluminous amounts of whiskey. And of course whiskey changes the way that your brain works. Women saddled with a sporting husband were likely to raise her children in poverty and to have, a, have to accept his drunken abuse. Whether it was physical abuse, whether it was sex, sexual abuse, they had to accept it. The U.S. Con consumption of alcohol in 1830 was 7.1 gallons of pure alcohol for each citizen. 7.1 gallons, that's pure alcohol, that's 180 proof. But of course there are very few liquors that are 180 proof. Maybe 90 proof, maybe 70 proof. So they were consuming a lot of alcohol. That's 14 gallons. That's 21 gallons of, of alcohol uh, per person. That's for each citizen. Women didn't drink normally. Only the men drank. So if you were married to somebody and each one of you got 7.1 gallons of pure alcohol, that meant the woman didn't consume anything at all, but the man consumed 14.2 gallons of pure alcohol, which means you can multiply all this out and it gets really, really ugly. If you compare it to the people today, everybody in the United States, not counting children, of course, but only counting adults, we only consume 1.8 gallons of pure alcohol a year. And in those days, it was 
five times it. As ugly as that sounds. The first state to prohibit the sale of alcohol was Maine, and it prohibited alcohol in 1851. The temperance movement worked up there. 1851. By, by 1855, one-third of the states in the United States had laws controlling the sale and the use of alcohol. This is 1855. This is before the Civil War. By 1920, enough states limited the use of alcohol to lead to the passage of the Volstead Act prohibiting the manufacture or sale of alcohol. And this is prohibition in the United States. So when we talk about prohibition, we're talking about most of the states in the Union have already had prohibition. We're only talking about a handful of states that didn't have prohibition. So it only affected a handful of states. The other states already had it. But alcohol wasn't the first psychoactive sub substance that we regulated. Remember, the Volstead Act was passed in 1929. In 1909, the Opium Exclusion Act was passed, banning the importation of opium into the United States for use uh, other than medicine. Opium. Of course, we use opium in a lot of different uh, ways. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act was passed, labeling opium as a narcotic to be controlled by the federal government. So it wasn't until 1914 that opium was really against the law. Actually, it was in, started in 19, 1909. Before that, if you could go to your, your pharmacist and get opium, they could sell it. It wasn't regulated at all. So you could get it. If you remember the movie about Wyatt Earp, his first lady, I don't think he was married to her, his first lady used laudanum. Laudanum is, is opium uh, in, uh, uh, dissolved in uh, alcohol. And she would drink it by the bottle, laudanum. It wasn't against the law. There was no problem with the drinking laudanum. You could use it. You could, you could have a bottle of it in your house for no reason whatsoever. And that was perfectly legal. Kind of expensive, but it's perfectly legal. The Vol Volstead Act was repealed in 1933. And one of the reasons was because we needed the, the uh, money from the sale of alcohol. We could tax it. And that's what people are saying about marijuana. We need to legalize marijuana. Then we, we, it won't be just the cartels that are making money. The federal government will be able to tax it. And now we can make money. We can have more and more money in taxes. But what is the sacrifice? Will we be sacrificing our children if we legalize marijuana? Well, we'll see what happens in Colorado. We'll see what happens along the West Coast. Uh, while the Volstead Act was repealed in 1933, other psychoactive substances have been added to the list of controlled substances in the United States. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the use and cultivation of cannabis. And of course, the, the, this is still intact. This Marijuana Tax Act is still intact. And the, uh, the current uh, DOJ, Department of Justice, has said that they're going to enforce this. You cannot cultivate it in the United States. So despite the fact that they've legalized it in Colorado, in California, in Oregon, in Idaho, in Washington, Alaska, and in Washington, D.C., despite the fact that they've legalized it, they can keep them from growing it because the law says they can't cultivate it. They could do that if they wanted to. Obama decided he wasn't going to, he was just going to let the states do what the states were going to do. So he wasn't going to prosecute for cultivation. You cannot grow marijuana uh, except in those states. That was the law under Obama. But now Jeff Sessions, we're not exactly sure what he's going to do. And it looks like... So they could overturn it on a federal level? It's, it's already a law. It's already a federal law. All they have to do is enforce it. They could go in and they could burn all these fields. The one north of Snowflake, which I guess takes up about like half the county, is this huge marijuana field north of Snowflake. And marijuana stinks. I'm, I swear, it's the nastiest smelling stuff in the world. You know, corn has a flavor or an odor when it grows. Uh, wheat and soybeans, <coughs> they all smell like something. Well, marijuana does too. And when you put a bunch of this stuff in one place, 
Oh my God, what a horrible smell. Anyway, I wouldn't want to drive past the marijuana fields. You're not going to get high right? just smelling the, the marijuana as it's growing, of course, but it has a stink about it, it has its odor about it, that is, very, that is relatively noxious, as it turns out. <clears throat> okay, okay, there was a lot of propaganda about marijuana. Uh, of course, they didn't know how to spell it. Uh, they said it, was, it made women go crazy. They turned into prostitutes. If you've ever watched the movie Reefer Madness, which is a fascinating movie, None of it's true. It's, it's just not really true. Uh, 1965 Drug Abuse Control Amendments uh, controlled the manufacture of stimulants and depressants. Uh, why in 1965? Uh, this had to do with the peace movement uh, in the United States, the anti-war movement. Also had to do with the civil rights movement. Uh, they, they were being fueled with, uh, with uh, diet pills, with speed uh, and marijuana. So they, uh, illegal marijuana, of course, but as long as you just had the pills, you were okay. But then in 1965, of course, everything changed. In 1970, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act consolidated all the drug legislation so that they would uh, be controlled out of the same office. That was in 1970. Uh, peace movement was still intact in 1970. And uh, Richard Nixon was really upset that uh, he became president saying that he was going to stop the war in Vietnam. He was elected in 1968. Uh, in 1970, they kicked the war up. Uh, they invaded Laos and Cam Cambodia. And they started trying to shut down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Well, it looked like he was, he was increasing what was going on in the war. Uh, and there were more and more protests. Uh, Kent State happened in 1970. And some college campuses uh, closed down uh, in protest of what was going on. Well, Richard Dixon was kind of a reclusive fellow, and he got very upset about all these things. He uh, was very upset about all of the uh, riots taking place in Washington, D.C., all the demonstrations. And so he looked for a way to stop the peace movement. And the best way that he could find uh, was to arrest people for, uh, not for demonstrating, that's not against the law. Demonstrating isn't against the law. But he could arrest them if he could find drugs on them. And he, so he passed all these drug laws. Well, who's going to be against a drug law against opium? Who's going to be against a drug law against marijuana? At the time, of course, they thought that, that marijuana was one of the worst substances in the world. Who's going to be against uh, taking speed out of kids' pockets? Nobody else because it, was really, it can really do a lot of harm. This is a very dangerous drug. Speed is extremely dangerous. Uh, so that's all he was, he was doing. But, in, uh, of course, at the same time, he was using this drug law to arrest the kids that were demonstrating against him. So there were a lot of kids in jail for demonst demonstrating against Richard Nixon. I demonstrated against Richard Nixon. I got put on his blacklist. Uh, a lot of strange things happened to me when I was in the military. <laughs> they were investigating me constantly about this, that, and the other. It's really hard, kind of hard to do anything with, with an individual that, that was a single parent with two kids. So, uh, usually when they, they called me in, of course they called me in as this radical. I'm a radical girl in, in the Air Force. But then when they found out that I had two kids at home, what is this? This is crazy. This is not something that we have to go. It's really kind of interesting. Anyway, a lot of interesting things happened to me while I was in the service. They didn't shoot me, though, it, which may have happened if I hadn't had the two kids. I don't know. Uh, so did the Volstead Act work? That's the real question that we have to ask ourselves. We, we see the movies about prohibition, about Al Capone, about smuggling alcohol, and we go, oh my God, it was a horrible time. People say, oh my, I couldn't get any alcohol. I just wanted a little drink. They had speakeasies all over the United States. Or did they? Did they have speakeasies all over the United States? A speakeasy was a, a place that sold alcohol. It's like a, a hidden bar. So you'd have to knock on the door and give them the, the password and they'd let you in. And then you could have all the alcohol that you want. Certain areas. Certain areas, exactly. That's exactly what was going on. 
the states that had already prohibited alcohol had no problem with the Volstead Act. Remember, there were a large number of states that already had prohibition of alcohol. They didn't have any speakeasies. They didn't have anybody smuggling alcohol into their states. They had been dry for an extended length of time. They didn't have a problem. It's the areas that, uh, that had alcohol before. They were the places that had problem, problems. And then, well, of course, one of those places was New, York, was New York City. Another of those places was Chicago. Another of those places was Kansas City. So yeah, there were problems in Kansas City, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Denver, places, uh, you know, uh, urban areas that had had, had alcohol before. Uh, the reality was that if you lived in a dry state like Maine, if you were, wanted to drink, then you went down to New York City to drink. But if you were in Maine, you were didn't have to worry about it. So the P, it was just like uh, if you were if you were uh, gay in the 1950s and 1960s, well, you didn't stay in rural Indiana because you could, for one thing you couldn't find a boyfriend and they didn't like you there. So if you were gay in the 1950s or 1960s, you went to some place where homosexuality was not frowned upon. So you you moved out of the rural area and you moved to the cities where nobody cared if you had sex with the same sex individual. Same way with alcohol. The people that wanted to drink moved to the cities. That's the way it worked. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> So we can look at the Volstead Act, and we can look at it from two different points of view. We can look at it from a negative point of view or a positive point of view. There were positive things that happened. There were good things that happened during Prohibition. Cirrhosis of the liver and other alcohol-related diseases declined dramatically because people couldn't drink as much. It was against the law. They had to hide the drink. The manufacture of alcohol was against the law, so it was really hard to find alcohol. So these people had to go and be teetotalers. They had to drink something else. The domestic violence fell in the United States. Violent crime actually fell by two thirds. So while we had uh, we had the the Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago, that's in Chicago. What was going on in Indianapolis? That was a dry state. Indiana is a dry state. What was going on in Indianapolis? Well, violent crime went down because Indiana didn't, they didn't have the same problem as Chicago did. They weren't smuggling alcohol in uh, through the uh, Lake Michigan. So it, it actually went down. In Kansas, it went down. Every place that uh, had alcohol, they, there was some alcohol use before, now all of a sudden they didn't have any alcohol use at all. And violent crime, <coughs> public drunkenness, of course, disappeared because if you were drunk in public, you got arrested and thrown in jail for a year and a half. For, for violating the rules for that. Uh, what negative things transpired uh, that were directly related to the Volstead Act? Uh, it, uh, organized crime increased. Uh, corruption of politicians increased. Corruption of law enforcement personnel increased. Uh, drinking eventually uh, returned to the pre-prohibition levels, but it took 20 years for the drinking level to go up. It had been a habit before, and now it wasn't. So it took 20 years for the, the, the level of drinking to get to the same point. Uh, and since the population had markedly increased, the amount of alcohol consumed was actually lower per person than it was before. And as you saw, they consumed 7.1 uh, gallons of, of raw, pure alcohol in 1830, and uh, today it's 1.8 gallons. So it worked. It changed our drinking habits in the United States. We stopped drinking hard liquor. We started drinking uh, um, alcohol that uh, was not nearly as strong. We started drinking more beer and wine. And of course, it's a lot harder to get drunk on beer and wine uh, because it doesn't have the alcohol level. Uh, if you drink hard, hard liquor, then it's really easy to get drunk really fast. And so your consum the consumption actually went down. Let me see if this works. I don't know if I have the internet. Booziest places in the world. This is kind of exciting. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh okay. It's not going to work. I can see it, but you can't see it. Wait a second. I'll tell you what the booziest places in the world are. I think. 
Okay, <clears throat> I'll put on my glasses. Okay, what are the booziest places in the world? Uh, ah. Um, booziest places in the world. Uh, Russia is the booziest place in the world. Yeah, Russia, uh, Europe, booziest place in the world. It's France, Spain, uh, England, Germany. Not Italy, strangely enough. Portugal, but not Spain. I'm sorry. Um, po uh, Poland, uh, Eastern, all of Eastern Europe, booziest places in the world. United States, not so much. Okay. Uh, the United States has one of the lowest rates of drinking in the developed world. New figures that new figures have revealed. Average Americans drink uh, just 9.4 liters of alcohol a year, uh, the same as uh, 470 pints of mild beer or 31 glasses of wine. The figure is much lower than in Europe, where the average British drinks. 1,100 pints of uh, beer per each year, and Russians have uh, 1,350 pints of beer and nine, 90 bottles of vodka a year. As odd as that sounds. Anyway, so the Europeans drink a lot more than we do. 90 bottles of vodka per person? Per year. That's a lot. Uh, I told you that once upon a time the uh, Soviet Union tried to control alcohol and they were fairly successful because it was a uh, tyrannical state. Uh, but once the uh, Soviet Union collapsed and it became a republic, um, they could do anything that they wanted. So the men started drinking more and more and more and the, uh, the uh, life expectancy went down six years in like two years for, uh, for men. About six years. Ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Anyway. Oops. Okay. We'll go back. There we go. Uh, history of psychoactive drugs. What's wrong with pot? Hip was grown in the United in the Americas with little problem until it first began to be smoked as a mild hallucinogen in Texas in 1910. From whence it spread to the rest of the West. It didn't really spread east. It spread west because well. I don't know why. Anyway. I don't know. I guess their influence wasn't as great uh, east as it was west. In the 1930s, the Hearst uh, uh, newspapers ran a propaganda campaign uh, to label marijuana as a narcotic. So it was the Hearst newspapers in, uh, in California that uh, alerted people to the bad, the horrible things about marijuana. Part of the complaint with marijuana was that it was being brought into the United States by Mexicans. Hearst hated Mexicans. Why? Nobody is really exactly sure. But he hated Mexicans. Uh, he was, so what he was actually trying to do was control the illegal uh, immigration of Mexicans into the United States. He was trying to stop it. So it, he did that by, uh, by uh, mounting a campaign against marijuana. By 1936, 38 states had branded marijuana as one of the most dangerous drugs. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the growth of marijuana in the United States. Now, these, of these 38 states, most of them were in the West. As a matter of fact, all the states in the West were, uh, had uh, labeled marijuana as the most dangerous drug, mainly because of first propaganda campaign. Marijuana was uh, used as a drug only in rural areas where it grew wild and in back rooms of cities where it was identified with jazz musicians and beat poets. So if you've ever watched the movie Back to the Future, which I did this past weekend, Back to the Future, the, the first one, the first movie, uh, if you remember, uh, Marty McFly is, uh, what is he doing? Um, they're chasing him, and uh, they, he gets thrown in the back, he gets thrown in the trunk of those guys' car, those uh, the, the black musicians, and when they come out of the car, there's smoke rolling out of the car, and they're they are holding really funny-shaped cigarettes. Well, they were, theoretically, they were smoking marijuana. 
This was in 1955. And the guys say something like, oh, don't mess with them, they're, they're, they have reefer madness or something. It was a joke. But the reality, but uh, of course, this is what was theoretically taking place. Only musicians used marijuana. Now, the marijuana that they were smoking at that time uh, was ditch weed. It was, it was not strong at all. It was very, very weak, as a matter of fact. And it really didn't uh, get you very high because it didn't have very much THC in it. Now the marijuana is much higher. In the 1950s and the 1960s, the influence of the beat poets' support uh, of use of psychoactive substances, including marijuana as an act of rebellion, caught on with the youth of the era. So people started smoking pot just as a, as a means of rebelling against their parents and rebelling against the system, rebelling against the state. Uh, if you read um, uh, Jack Kerouac, uh, his On the Road, uh, while they were driving from, from uh, New York City to California, uh, they were smoking pot along the way. Um, uh, if you look at uh, all, some of the other beat poets, uh, Allen Ginsberg, for example, he has whole poems about how wonderful marijuana is. With the beginning of the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement, uh, it became entangled with youthful rebellion, which by this time was connected to marijuana usage, and they, the federal government was able to tie all this stuff together and then arrest people on the street, demonstrators on the street, for using marijuana because they were anti-Vietnam War protesters. And they were jacking people up all over the place. And usually they couldn't, they couldn't arrest them for demonstra demonstrating because that wasn't against the law. But what they arrested them for was uh, marijuana usage or marijuana in the area. Uh, they would uh, uh, break into an apartment, and if there was any marijuana in the apartment, they just arrested everybody in the apartment, not just the owner uh, or the uh, person that had uh, was living in the apartment, but everybody in the apartment. And by that way, they were able to, to uh, f uh, fracture the uh, peace movement that was taking place. Amphetamines were first synthesized in, in 1887 in Germany. Over the years, the substance was used as an inhaler under the name uh, benzedrine and as an appetite suppressant. So these were all legal things. Uh, during World War II, amphetamines were used to combat <coughs> fatigue by, by both sides. Uh, the Japanese used it, the, the Americans used it, and the Germans used it. I told you that my dad was driving an ammunition truck before the war, uh, and uh, they, they gave him amphetamines, but he didn't use them. Uh, my dad actually was able to, he had to have surgery in order to repair, to have his hemorrhoids repaired. Once he had his hemorrhoids repaired, he was able to join the army, and he spent four years uh, in, in Europe, while well, he spent two years in Europe, uh, fighting in uh, the, the European uh, uh, theater. And he survived, obviously, he survived, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Anyway, he survived. But they tried to give him amphetamines. Oh, I'm sorry. There's nudity in the next, in the, on the next slide. It's kind of hard to tell they're painting her chest, but there is nudity. In the 18, 1950s and 1960s, amphetamines were used in diet pills. Uh, by 1970, it was estimated that 6 to 8% of Americans were using diet pills. Well, let's not call it speed. Let's just call it diet pills. Amphetamines were part of the fuel of the hippie movement. And the Summer of Love in 1967, that's the year I graduated from high school. It's the year I set the record. That is, that's why I'm being inducted into the Athletic Hall of Fame. 1967, Summer of Love. Uh, Congress passed the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, mostly to, con to control the demonstrators, the anti-establishment demonstrators uh, of the, 19, of the uh, 1960s, the hippies. The yuppies, not the yuppies, the hippies, and the, what's the other term they used for them? Anyway, there were a bunch of really strange people. Of course, in 1971, I went into the military. The first job, I, since I was over the age of 21, uh, the first, one of the first jobs I had was observing uh, urine collection, or uh, drug uh, specimen collections. I had to watch people pee, because I was over the age of 21. That's what all. year was this? 1971, 71, 72, 73. That's what I, that's, I did that a lot during my time in the service. I watched people urinate. 
not only do you have to watch them urinate, but then you have to secure the body to make sure that it's not, it doesn't get, become contaminated. Uh, so you, you immediately have to put uh, um, tape over it that, that uh, you can't break. So that, yeah, it, it's, it's all illegal and whatnot. It was a mess. It was just a mess. Anyway, they wanted to uh, find out if their, if their soldiers were, were using amphetamines or whatever. Uh, sports were pretty much the purview of the wealthy and the extremely gifted through the first half of the 20th century. It wasn't important to, enough to try to cheat or to gain any advantage uh, because these people were all, uh, they, they were all uh, sporty, sport, sportsmen. Uh, and they either had a lot of money or they were really good. Uh, and these became your professional athletes, the wealthy people or the people that were really, really good. Um, we talk about in the NCAA, you can, you can compete for four years in, because of the NCAA. Uh, before the NCAA became, became the NCAA, uh, people used to go to college for seven or eight years. They were almost like professional college athletes. So, you know, there, there were people that went to, to uh, Purdue for four years and were really good football players, and then they went to Northwestern for three years, and they were really good football players there. Uh, so they became, you know, they became professional athletes in, 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 in essence. With the Cold War after World War II, every field where the uh, free world met the communist world became a battlefield of sorts. So before the 1960s, uh, before the 1960s, the Olympics were mostly wealthy people and really good, and really good athletes. This is uh, Johnny Weissmiller, who became Tarzan in the movies. Uh, Johnny Weissmiller was a swimmer. He was a lifeguard, and they found out that he was really good. He was a really strong swimmer. Uh, so he went to the Olympics and won, of course, and then he parlayed his Olympic gold medal into an acting career, and he became Tarzan. So if you watch any of the old Tarzan movies, you're going to see uh, Johnny Weissman. Another individual you're going to see is Buster Crabb, another Olympic gold medal uh, swimmer, uh, Buster Crabb. So if you watch old Tarzan movies, these are the guys that you get to see. But then the Cold War started. It was us against them. It was the bad guys against the good guys, democracy versus communism. And of course, the communists wanted to win. They wanted to show that communism produced better athletes than the than democracies did. So they started using performance enhancing drugs. Eastern Bloc countries led by the example of East Germany began giving their athletes anabolic steroids, creating super athletes. The world was appalled by the results and came out against the practice in 1968. Uh, since then, all amateur athletic organizations have banned the use of steroids along with professional athletic organizations around the world. This is a shot putter, a lady shot putter from East Germany. This is what she looks like today. I'm sorry, this is what he looks like today. He took so many steroids when he was uh, competing that it changed his gender. To change, changed his gender. He's a male today. And they were doing this to a lot of different people. Sometimes they weren't telling them that they were, usually they didn't tell them. This is a communist country and they can do anything to you that they want. They can steal you out of your crib and make you into a world-class athlete by feeding you whatever they feed you, these performance enhancing drugs. And they did. They did this for, for decades. East Germans, especially the East Germans, they were the best at it. Remember, Germany, the Germans were really good at pharmaceuticals. This is before World War II. They were, they were almost, they were the ones that invented aspirin. They were the ones that first synthesized uh, amphetamines. They were the first, first ones to, to synthesize this and that and the other. They were the ones that came up with all these steroids, these anabolic steroids that actually worked. And of course, East Germany, uh, became a, a powerhouse. They won several Olympics because of the, their women winning gold medals and because their men were so much faster and stronger than, than uh, people from democracies. Did it but, really enhance the performance? Oh yeah. Well, you can imagine. 
anything that takes strength. Anabolic steroids allow you to, uh, to, to uh, exercise, and it, it, it accelerates your, your recovery from, that's what exercise does, it breaks down your yeah, muscles, muscles, then you have to build them back up, right? But anabolic steroids accelerate the, the, uh, the building back up portion of it. So you can exercise every day, whereas if, if we go to the gym and lift, uh, we're going to break our muscles down. It's going to take two or three days for our muscles to repair before we can lift those muscles, use those muscles again. But of course, if you use With anabolic steroids, steroids, it just repairs them. Almost instantaneous. All you have to do is take a nap. It repairs it while you sleep. So the next day, you can go and lift again. And you, suddenly, you can lift more and more and more. And weight. not feel sore. Not feel sore at all. And you can lift every day. Now the problem is that your bones can only take so much tension. So a lot of times what happens when you use anabolic steroids, you build your muscles so large that it rips from the, the bone. So and this is one of the ways we can tell if somebody has been on performance enhancing and drug. Performance enhancing drugs is if they have torn their muscles away from their bone. I had a friend, he was a bodybuilder in Arizona. His dad lived down the field. He was my daughter's roommate. He was a bodybuilder. And uh, one time he tore his pec. Well, it's really hard to tell you, tear your pectoral muscle. These things are all matted together. So he ripped that sucker away from his, from his chest. You know, he would flex his muscle and he had this great big bump. It looked like a tumor. It was his muscle had torn away from his pack. And, and when, he, when that happened, my daughter knew that he'd been using steroids. He swore that he, he wasn't, but of course he couldn't deny it at this point. So he had to have a surgical repair. And he was Mr. Olympia in Arizona three, for three years. Not because of the steroids, but because, uh, because he was a weightlifter, bodybuilder. But he had tried to use steroids, and his muscles became so large that he actually tore his muscles away from his bone. As not funny as that is. It takes about a year for that to repair. Sedatives have been used since the beginning of the 20th century in the form of bromides, chloral hydrate, and para, uh, para aldehyde. Para aldehyde. Uh, barbitol was marketed as ver Veranol in 1903. Phenobarbital was developed in 1913. If you watch old movies, they'll talk about barbitol and they'll talk about phenobarbital. And all of these are, yeah, all of these things are, are sedatives. These are like uh, Valium. Sedatives become very pop became very popular during the Depression and World War II eras, peaking in, uh, in this period with over 50 different barbiturates dominating the market. Valium used to be the number one drug sold in the world. Then it, it was Prozac. And now it's Viagra, as odd as that seems. So many men with performance with, uh, uh, with uh, erectile dysfunction. Who would have thought? I know, it's kind of odd. In the 1950s, doctors realized that they had not only overprescribed the drugs, but that, it, that they had created a whole generation of addicted adults. If you listen to old, uh, uh, what is that group? Uh, in, I mean, Mother's Little Company, The Rolling Stones. Um, that what they were talking about were sedatives. Mother's little helper were sedatives. That they were talking about. They were they were talking about phenobarbital actually. In the 1950s and 1960s, a whole group of milder tranquilizers were developed to replace the more dangerous tranquilizers. Milltown and benzodiazepines such as Librium, Valium, and Zan Xanax, Clonopin, and Halcyon became the most widely used drugs in the world. Uh, during Vietnam War, I was working as a medic, and uh, I was good friends with the pharmacist. Uh, I went down there, and uh, they said, "Look at this. This is crazy. This is the craziest thing in the world. We have all these drugs, and they come in gallon jugs. They come in gallon containers. They used to get uh, Valium and Librium in five-gallon buckets, and they would dispense them by the hundreds." And that's because they were uh, the wives of the guys that were over, overseas, that were in the combat zone. Uh, these ladies would, get ang would have anxiety about their husbands, of course, 
And what, what did we do? We juiced them up with liberty and value. We, be, we made them addicted. And it was kind of, uh, kind of a joke on, the, on base that if uh, you were a female, uh, of course you were, you were a civilian, but uh, you, you uh, could go to the pharmacy and get all the uh, valium and liberium that you wanted. Yeah. Because you're, you could say, well, I'm, I'm anxious. You could just tell the doctor, I'm anxious because my husband might get shipped overseas at any, at any time. Uh, so they just juice these ladies up with buckets and buckets of valium and liberium. Liberium is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If you had a wife that uh, was giving you a hard time, you could take her to the doctor, and and he would give her Valium and Librium. It would make her so much so easier. There, exactly, exactly. She's so much easier to deal with. I'm sure she's walking around the house with a really happy smile on her face. <laughs> Which is like having sex with a corpse. <laughs> I feel sorry for that lady, you know, whoever she is. <laughs> of course, those are, uh, Librium and Valium were both addictive. And these ladies. So that explains all those old movies where the woman's just like pills. Right. Exactly. Valium and Librium. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, wealthy people. Valium yeah. and lots of, yep. lots and lots of Valium and Librium. You bet. I know. You're a rock star. You can get fentanyl. My God. Prince kills himself with fentanyl. Well, you can't get, they don't prescribe fentanyl. They don't, they don't give it to people. This is, some, this is a medication that doctors control. Hmm. What the hell is he doing with fentanyl? And then we find out that Tom Petty overdosed on three different types of fentanyl. I know. So how did they... How did they get it? They found a doctor that would give it to them. Yeah. That's why, that's why Michael Jackson, and Michael Jackson, that's why Michael Jackson's uh, doctor was in jail. Because he gave him drugs that he wasn't, that were supposed to be controlled by him. Yeah, exactly. Ergot, uh, barley rust had created havoc wherever it, it appeared, and no one knew uh, why until the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman isolated the active ingredient uh, lysergic acid diethylamide from the fungus. It's a fungus, and that's where lysergic acid diethylamide. And this is this is uh, Albert Hoffman as a child, or as a young man. I showed you a picture of him as another man. Uh, after his discovery, Hoffman accidentally dosed himself and discovered the psychedelic effects of the substance. This stuff is amazing. You can if, you can take a drop of it, and if it gets on any mucous membrane, it'll get into your system. And what he did, he splashed it in his eye. And then all of a sudden, he went on a trip. It scared the holy hell out of him, as you can imagine. The US Army and the CIA bought the rights to LSD uh, from Hoffman and experimented with the drug through the 50s into the 60s. They were trying to weaponize LSD. One of the researchers working with the CIA was Dr. Timothy Leary uh, of Harvard University, who decided that the psychedelic substance needed to be shared with the world. He also accidentally splashed it into his eye, and he took a trip, and it was such a, a mind-expanding uh, opportunity for him that, that he decided to share it with the rest of the world. This stuff was secret. It was a secret substance. It's easy to make. Lysergic acid diethylamide turns out to be, any chemist can make it, and so Timothy Leary gave it to the rest of the world. 1.5 billion people drink alcohol around the world. 76 million of these people have an alcohol abuse problem, including this guy. 11.50, right? Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, 180 million people around uh, worldwide abuse illicit drugs. Uh, hey, that's not so many. There's, what, 7 billion people in the world? And only 180 million of those people abuse illicit drugs? That's not so many. 160 million people worldwide uh, smoke marijuana each year. That probably uh, has changed since we've legalized marijuana in five states in the United States. 
It has been estimated that 20 to 60 percent of all hospital beds are inhabited due to drug abuse, which is irritating if, you're, if you work in medicine. Because most of the people that come in the emergency room are there because they've done something stupid. Yeah. And now you have to take care of them. Now you have to save their lives. Of course you do. You do anyway. I'm not going to let this one die. You know, you can't do that. That doesn't work. You'll get sued. Illicit drug, uh, drugs uh, figure into the economic structure both uh, where they are grown and where they are used. Uh, heroin is a, a cash crop, as is cocaine, as is marijuana, as is MDMA, uh, ecstasy, and methamphetamines. Of course, all of these, uh, not all of these, have been a problem here. Sure they have. Uh, heroin uh, smuggling across the border, cocaine smuggling, uh, marijuana in this area uh, has been a problem for an extended length of time. Probably not MDMA, that's kind of an East Coast thing. With methamphetamines, of course, in any rural area. If you have uh, cold capsules and uh, liquid ammonia, the fertilizer that they use on the fields, you can make methamphetamines. It's called the Nazi method. Illegal heroin is grown in four areas of the world. Uh, the Golden Crescent is an area in Southwest Asia that encompasses areas of Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. And so that's where heroin is grown. Uh, you have to remember that this area was controlled by the Brits. And remember when they started the opium wars. Well, the reason they did it is because they were growing opium in Afghanistan in the, in the uh, Golden Crescent. They were using this area as uh, an area to, to grow opium so that they could sell it to the Chinese. So it was all started by the Brits. Sorry. For tea, exactly, so that they could get their tea. Right. Tea is very important, extremely important. Uh, the Golden Triangle encompasses parts of Southeast Asia, countries, countries of Thailand, uh, Myanmar, which used to be Burma, and of course Laos. And this is known as the Golden Triangle. When I was stationed in Vietnam, uh, this was a really serious problem. All these drugs would come to Vietnam, and that's where they would transship from. So you not only had, you're not only fighting the war, but you also had all this drug smuggling taking place. Well, one of the other problems was that the GIs, of course, uh, were some of these guys were using this stuff uh, fairly extensively. Uh, if you've ever watched the movie, what is it, Platoon, it's, they, and this is what they're using. They're using tie sticks. They're using uh, marijuana that has uh, heroin in it and they're getting stoned even, even worse than they would otherwise. Mexico exports a form of heroin that is dark in color and called black tar or brown heroin. It's not as strong as white heroin. It's not as processed as white heroin. And therefore, it's not quite as addictive. Uh, Colombia not only exports cocaine to the United States, but a white heroin as well. White heroin found in the Golden Triangle, Golden Crescent, and Colombia is much purer and stronger heroin than the black tar or the black or the brown heroin coming out of Mexico. Uh, but it's all hero heroin. How strong is the heroin that you have, may have a uh, package of? Of course, none of them have a package of heroin. But if you did, how strong is it? Well, the, the answer is you never know. You never know. You never know if it's the good stuff or if it's not the good stuff or if it's been cut with something, it's probably been cut. Yeah. Because the more you cut it, the more, the you higher sell. your cut Exactly. You sell the, the, uh, the uncut stuff and the cut stuff at exactly the same rate. Mm -hmm. So the more sugar you, you mix with your heroin, the more money you can make. This gets exciting. I know, I get, I get excited when I think about this. 90% of the world's uh, supply of illicit heroin comes from the poppy fields of Afghanistan. Now remember, we've occupied Afghanistan. Remember that? When our army went in there and occupied these areas? Well, we stopped the uh, heroin production in that area. We did that pretty much. Uh, one of, one of, I'm sorry? Heroin comes from poppies? Yeah, heroin poppies, certain types of poppies. So, like the Muslim laws, countries like 
Exactly. Yes. <laughs> right. Good point. Well, now you see the Wizard of Oz differently yeah. than, than you did before. I know. So we stopped, we, we stopped heroin production in Afghanistan to some extent. We couldn't stop all of it, but we stopped a lot of it. My brother was stationed in Afghanistan in 2005. He was able to talk the local chiefs into warehousing their heroin. In other words, not selling it. They were going to hold on to it. He talked them into that. So for the year that he was there, the year that he was stationed in his area of Afghanistan, there was zero heroin production, even though they warehouse all this stuff. Uh, my brother is, uh, everyone in my family, we're not very religious people, so the last thing we do would be proselytize. We're not evangelicals, okay? I have an aunt that is an evangelical. But when my brother was over there, so he was dealing with all these individuals on an equal basis, because they're very Muslim people. They're extremely Muslim. <clears throat> but of course, he didn't try to convert anyone anything because what we can vote them to. He's an atheist. You know, he's just a non believer okay? He's a non believer So while he was there, everything was fine. The guy that came in and replaced him was a was an evangelical. He was an evangelical Christian. And this guy started preaching to all these Muslims, all these staunch Muslims. He started trying to proselytize. He started trying to convert them to Christianity. And it offended them. So guess what happened next? Remember that warehouse of heroin? That, that uh, they had, uh, that, all that heroin that they had warehouse? They all put, they put it all out on the market. Because they, uh, they were offended by this asshole that was trying to proselytize, trying to convert them. I mean, if somebody is a, if, if you're a really staunch whatever, you don't want to hear me try to convert you to something else. It's going to irritate you. It's going to, it's going to offend you. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened over there. And that is, that's the problem that we have continually had over in Afghanistan, is that we've got all these idiot military people going over there and offending their religion. <sighs> so stupid. But this is something we can't even talk about, unfortunately. We can't even talk about it because you can't talk about religion in the military. And, uh, yeah. But then again, they go out. You can't tell somebody they can't preach. You can't tell them that. <laughs> go ahead, go out and preach. Do whatever you want. Try to convert everybody. It'll work. <laughs> no. But you can't tell people that. They get offended. It gets really weird because... In the military? Well, the military, you can't even talk about it. Um, oh, yeah. Are there some Afghanistan can't? No. What are we going to do? Only send atheists? <laughs> well, actually, on your, uh, on your dog, dog tag, it tells, you what, it tells them what religion you are. So that if you're dying, they can give you... They can preach to you in the right language and the right... Talk to you in the right language. Yeah. Okay, okay. So what are we going to do? Check our everybody's dog tags to see if they have no religious preference. That's what mine said. That's what his said, no religious preference. They didn't send him over there because he was a non-believer. They sent him over there because they needed a soldier. Yeah. They needed somebody there. Someone that exactly. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't say evangelical. It just says Protestant. Or it says yeah. Methodist. Or it says yeah. Baptist or something. Okay. But you can't do that. You can't. You can't give somebody a, 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 a an assignment because of their religion. It's against. It's against the law. It's against the rules. Anyway, sixty percent of Afghanistan's wealth comes from opium sales. <coughs> this is true. Uh, and the United States uh, efforts to curb production has resulted in an increase, actually an increase in uh, by fifty percent. One of the reasons that they have an increase is because we have this tomorrow. And that's unfortunately the way it works. I'm not saying this is the only reason why, 
but that is one of the reasons why. <clears throat> uh, the Nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang, uh, Kuomintang party uh, dealt with the drug tongs of Shanghai while they controlled China. This is really kind of interesting. We're talking about politics, and when we talk about politics, usually we just talk about politics. We don't talk about where did the money come from? How did they finance all of this? Well, one of the things that was going on in China, of course, we're trying to get the Chinese to fight against the Japanese. We were looking for a strong leader in China. Well, he'd been part of the, uh, uh, the Tongs in Shanghai all of his life. So Chiang Kai-shek was actually able to raise an army and to finance that army through drug use or through drug sales, as strange as that may seem. After the Kuomintang uh, were expelled from China, they lost the, the war against the Red Chinese in 1949, and they went to Taiwan. Uh, they continued to grow and market opium along the thai Burma border in order to buy weapons for their defense against the Chinese. So these guys were, were actually using drug money from the Golden Triangle uh, to finance the war against the communists, as odd as that seems. Now, as Americans, what are we going to do about this? Drugs are illegal in the United States. We don't finance our wars through drug, drug sales in the United States. So what did we do about the Kuomintang? What did we do about Chiang Kai-shek? Nothing. Because he was our ally. We pretended that it wasn't taking place. We pretended that it wasn't happening. That's politics. That's good politics, my golly. Uh, we've done this before. We did this with Noriega in Panama. Panama was a, a go-between for, uh, for drug smuggling. And he was smuggling into the United States. And we were ignoring it because he was our ally. But as soon as he started getting too bold, we shut him down. And pretended, he's, he's smuggling drugs? I had no idea. Oh my goodness. Is your daughter okay? Yeah. Okay. It just takes a long time. Everybody's got the flu right. This is strange, isn't it? Except that us and here we're all healthy. Yeah. Sorry, I, I meant to ask you about it upstairs. Appreciate it. No, no problem. Uh, the Vietnam War was a quagmire. It was a mess. The Vietnam War was a mess. We thought we were fighting a political war. It turned out to be a religious war. It turned out to be a civil war. It turned out to be a drug war. We had no clue. Uh, not only was the war being fought in the Golden Triangle, but the United States allied itself with some of the most notorious drug smugglers in the area, the Hmong. So we allied ourselves with this group of individuals. We hired them to fight, to, uh, to infiltrate uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and to disrupt the, the movement of supplies. And these guys were really good. I don't know if you've ever, the, the Ho and the, the Hmong were the two groups that we hired. The CIA hired them. Well, these guys were drug smugglers. So besides smuggling drugs, they were also murdering North, uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. These guys are the most vicious people you can possibly imagine. They will smile and stab you at the same time. They will slit your throat. They are sweet, but at the same time, they're vicious. So it gets really, really strange. So we hired these whole villages of people. So after we lost the war in Vietnam, what did we do with it? Well, some of these people we, we allowed to immigrate to the United States. We brought, actually, the CIA brought them over because otherwise the uh, communists would have, would have uh, annihilated them. So we brought them to, to the United States. If you've ever seen the movie Gran Torino, okay, that's about the Hmong, the Hmong in Detroit. I know, it's kind of interesting. Fascinating, isn't it? This guy has a problem with him because he was a Korean War vet. He didn't like Asian music. And That's he, a good movie. That is a good movie, too. Yeah, and the right thing happens in the middle. The Hmong were, the, were excellent allies against North Vietnamese and Viet Cong as they moved freely through Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam and fought, fought the communist soldiers uh, who encroached in their area. They just killed them, and they were really good at it, and they killed anybody. Uh, they would capture them and, and they'd be smiling and, and acting like they want to let them go and they'd just shoot them all or slip them all their throats. These guys are amazing. Cocaine doesn't uh, grow just uh, anywhere. 
Uh, cocaine grows mainly in the humid mountain valleys of Colombia, Peru, and, and uh, Bolivia. Actually, most uh, cocaine grows in Peru. It doesn't grow in uh, Colombia, despite the fact that it's all smuggled out of uh, Colombia. Co cocaine has been at the, political, the forefront of political problems in Colombia for over half a century. Drug cartels operate with impunity throughout the country and control many of the decisions being made locally and nationally. If you've ever seen the movie Romancing the Stone, one of the things that happens, she goes to Colombia, remembers they find a plane. What's the plane full of? Marijuana? Really? No. They don't smuggle marijuana. It's too bulky. But they smuggle cocaine. But it, uh, in order to make the movie plausible or something, I guess, they, they have a, 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 a transport plane full of uh, marijuana that they find. Uh, la, 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 la. Unfortunately, they, the drug cartels control Colombia. Worldwide, 25 million people the size of Texas and Montana, the number of people in Texas and Montana, uh, have died from AIDS, and another 40 million, uh, that's the size of California plus Oregon, are infected with HIV worldwide. In the United States, around 900,000 people, that's the number of people in Montana, uh, are infected with HIV, while 500,000 uh, people, uh, that's the population of Seattle, have died of AIDS. So as you can see, worldwide, there's a lot, of, a lot more people that have AIDS than in just in the United States. The United States is not that serious a problem. Not quite as serious a problem. Okay. Uh, why don't we stop right here? The geopolitics as well. I'll finish the chapter next time, I promise. I know I'm going a little bit slow. And I blame... It's actually a long chapter. It is a long chapter. Yeah, 110. 110. And I just added another slide. So it's actually 110. It's 110. Oh, yeah. yeah. You probably noticed that yeah, I split that one. Yeah, when I was talking about paper. 61 and 62. Yeah. Yeah. I got wild this morning. <laughs> okay, well, I'll see you guys next time. Oh, let me turn this thing off. See you next time.